My name is Mel Horwich, and I'm the dean of CEU Business School, which is still located across the river, but we are getting closer to the main campus all the time. Uh, and I've, uh, I've been dean for five months, so this is my first experience with the summer school, and it's a great experience. Uh, we're delighted to participate. Uh, I, uh, I'd like to welcome you here on behalf, at this uh, important event, on behalf of uh, CEU Business School. And uh, I usually start with uh, cracking some jokes and kind of make people feel welcome, but this, is, I think, is a very serious topic, corruption and how uh, companies deal with it in Central Europe, the former Soviet Union, and indeed around the world. It's a serious topic, and it needs to be dealt with, I think, in a, a serious fashion. Uh, we certainly have to understand uh, how, we, how a firm or, indeed, a top executive gains and maintains and nurtures and keeps what might be called a moral compass in the face of very complex pressures uh, that certainly occur not just here but around the world, including my own country, the United States. Uh, this topic certainly has to do with uh, accelerating innovation, entrepreneurship, access to in, uh, economic opportunity by all citizens, which are a very important part of uh, CU Business School's new mission in addition uh, to teaching integrity and I don't understand how you can have true innovation without uh, equal access uh, by all people qualified and giving them all the same chance. So this is fundamental. Uh, the whole issue of uh, dealing with corruption, in my view, as a business school, longtime business school professor and now dean, certainly has to do with the very meaning a professionalism in management. What is a professional manager? And how can we nurture in professional managers uh, integrity, integrity in doing their jobs? How do we teach it? And obviously, business schools in some ways have not done a very good job. Uh, I personally am embarrassed when I see that alumni of my own institution, my own business school, or student, former students, or alumni of places I've taught are publicly exposed as uh, managers who have cheated, who have practiced corruption, and indeed have prayed and taken advantage of hardworking uh, colleagues in their own organization. Business schools have to do a better job, and we have to learn how to do that. So with this, with this as background, I'd just like to say that I have certain expectations for this session, serious, deep, concrete expectations. And they certainly include the following, and I hope we can address them at this meeting. The first is we should find out how and why, in almost a granular way, such events happen. We need to understand them better, and we are fortunate to have uh, three panelists and, a, and an experienced moderator help us out to do this. We need to find out why such events happen so we can somehow prevent them from happening again. Also, we need to learn how firms have put into place systems, procedures, rules, training programs, uh, hiring and promotion practices so that such events are less likely to happen again, less likely to happen in the future. It is very important that we find this out from firms, from actual firms who have done this. In addition, I think we have to learn at business schools and elsewhere how to educate and train professional managers and other professionals so that they don't act this way. We have to learn how, in effect, to teach our students to become uh, somehow more grounded, more immune to the attractions, potentially, 
of acting in a less than ethical manner. For that, we are lucky to have today, in effect, live case studies from firms or experienced people who have been associated or understand such firms so that we can instill in our students, in all of us, better judgment, a better set of working principles for ethical and effective behavior by modern managers today. And, we, and this is a real challenge at all business schools, including CEU Business School. So with that in mind, I just want to, first of all, thank Frederick for organizing this impressive event. And I think I'm looking forward to the panel and discussion. And Frederick, I'll just turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Do we need it? Yes. It helps? Yeah. 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 So then we'll use it. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Mel, for those opening remarks. Let me just put a little bit of context and to why we convened this meeting and why we're having this public panel on this theme. We're having the public panel here because uh, we are running an integrity school, which is covering a range of themes. We have participants this year. Uh, some 50 plus participants from over 30 countries and and the integrity school this year is addressing amongst others the theme of business integrity in emerging markets the other three topics are rebuilding the post-war state from below uh, electoral integrity and electoral justice and e-accountability now this is the first year that we're doing uh, a policy lab, we call it, on business integrity. And the reason we're doing that is that this is also the first year of a joint collaboration, a five-year project, between the Central European University Business School and Thierry, the NGO that I head, to address the issue of integrity education, developing curricula around this issue to address the very challenges that Mel was referring to. And the sponsor of that initiative is Siemens, the company for which Del Martin here is the CEO in Hungary. Now, why is Siemens supporting this initiative? It's worth taking a little step back to just set the context for that. Because there is a darker side to the story, and I think there's a very positive side going forward. But the darker side to the story is that Siemens, three years ago, paid the biggest fines in corporate history for bribery that they were found to be responsible for around the world. Over a billion dollars worth of bribes and cases were found, stretching from Venezuela to the Oil for Food program in Iraq, to Indonesia and, and Russia, amongst other places. Now, why did that happen at that time, when in fact there had been stories circulating for quite some time, and there had been investigations before, is a confluence of factors. But one of the factors was that Siemens had listed on the New York Stock Exchange a few years previously. And as a company listed on the New York Stock Exchange, it fell under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Department of Justice and the Securities and Exchange Commission. And the numbers are quite staggering because Siemens ended up paying $1.6 billion worth of fines. The previous highest fine paid was $33 million. So this was an order of magnitude larger. And, and it paid those fines both in the U.S and in Germany. And now, in a separate case, not involving the US Department of Justice, uh, in a case actually involving World Bank funded projects, and amongst others then in Russia, as part of a settlement of that, the Siemens negotiated an, an agreement with the World Bank, launching what we now call the Siemens Integrity Initiative. And that's an unparalleled step in corporate history, which was a commitment by Siemens to make $100 million worth of grants over the next 15 years towards initiatives that would work in two areas. One is towards collective action, and the other is towards integrity education. And the CEU with Thierry won one of these grants towards integrity education with a very ambitious plan to expand and develop integrity education 
uh, at, in universities and business schools right across Central Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, with a few focus countries. And, uh, and the nice news is, is that in a sense we are ahead of schedule even. The number of universities expressing interest in this is very strong. Now against a backdrop of, of a company that did use bribery, and I'm not afraid to say so, unfortunately it is the case, and this is what the regulators found, that used bribery quite systematically and for a number of years in many markets where they operated. Siemens has decided to, to change course radically. And, and, of course, time will tell the extent to which this radical course correction is really working. But I think the fascinating dimension to this, and you could say I say so because we're part of it, but I think it's a genuinely fascinating move, is that through the Siemens Integrity Initiative, they're also recognizing that this is a problem that a company can solve on its own. And they can't wait for regulators to solve this for them. And so this $100 million, which comparatively speaking, just to put it in context, Siemens paid $1.6 billion in fines, but they also paid almost the same amount in legal fees for the law firms and uh, accountancy firms and auditors who were working with them in that process. So the $100 billion is actually a fairly small sum <coughs> compared to all of that. Nonetheless, it represents the biggest investment that's ever happened in this area. Now, the other context for addressing this issue now is, our, is the Arab awakening. This region experienced enormous transformations, of course, 22 years ago. And now, with the social revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt that have had their ripple effects right through the Arab world, we're experiencing something that has reminiscences, although the context is very different to our region here. But what is very clear is that in both Tunisia and in Egypt, corruption and the anger, public anger against corruption, were major factors in the social revolutions there. Human rights abuses, the abuse of power, and the large-scale corruption. In the case of Tunisia, it was the wife of Ben Ali and the clan around the wife of Ben Ali having amassed enormous wealth. In Egypt, it was the sums of Mubarak and the phenomenal sum that had been circulating of a fortune of $70 billion that they were said to have accumulated. And that was a tipping point for public anger. Now looking back over these 22 years here since the fall of the Berlin Wall, since tourists leaving yeah, Germany and elsewhere going through Hungary and border guards in Hungary decided to let them through. But also since accession to the European Union only a few years ago. How has this environment, both in Hungary and the wider region, changed? So we have with us here a panel, starting with Peter Köhler, who is a retired German banker with very wide-ranging experience from doing business right through the region with a number of years spent in perhaps the most contested and difficult market of them all, Russia, heading up a, a big foreign bank in Moscow. Del Martin, you've spent many years in various locations, Japan, but also in, within the region, and now most recently, since less than a year, uh, in, or just over a year, as, as CEO of Siemens Group. And, and Willy Benko, an American who decided to seize the opportunity some years ago. And you settled here, but you also invested here. That's correct. An entrepreneur, an investor, who has his own experience and a commitment to business integrity, which he manifests, among others, by lecturing at the CU Business School about it, but also being willing to be here in the panel with us. So, as, as, uh, as Mel was saying, what we want to explore is how different organizations, businesses, have been responding to the context, how they are trying to ensure that they are not falling into the trap of the lowest common denominator, but also with a view to these last two decades. What changes have you seen? Can I start with, with you, Peter Kölder? 
you you spent the last several years you you were in the belly of the beast working in Moscow which is infamous to most but very few have had first-hand experience of doing as much business there as you have how do banks try to protect themselves in that environment is everyone successful in trying to do so um, we have our own you have your own activated there's a switch on the bottom on and off okay well, thank you frederick uh, as you just said i was all my life in in banking or in financial institutions most of the type of banking which you would call with the terrible name investment banking so usually when i go somewhere i don't say i was working in a bank uh, I would rather say I'm a used car dealer or whatever. Uh, and uh, for two years I'm now in Oxford and I'm in academia. And I always thought, you know, in academia it's the clear world. But I remember for kissing one said, the politics of universities makes me long for the sim simplicity of the Middle East. <laughs> so, so, so corruption and not integrity is not only in business, let's face it. It's in government, it's in NGOs, it's in academics, it's everywhere, just in a different way, whatever. And anyway, what, what did we in business do? I think the following thing happened. First of all, I grew up in an area um, with Siemens as my customer, where you had a sort of moral relativism. So my first statement is, moral relativism is dead. Just forget about it. Which means, when you are in Rome, do as the Romans do. The Chinese don't read the Bible, they forgot Confucius, so the Chinese think different. And uh, when it, whatever you do in the Middle East is according to what, what they have to do. Uh, also, expressed in legal terms. For example, in Germany, until you just told me, until 1999, you could not bribe in Germany. Uh, you could not deduct uh, bribes in Germany, but you could deduct bribes from taxes as nützliche uh, Aufwendung is the term as useful uh, cost, okay, whatever, whatever that means. Now, um, this just means in Germany, you cannot bribe a German, but you can bribe somebody outside Germany, which is, which means, you know, an incredible statement, you know, when you, when you think about it. This means we are so clean, or we want to be clean, but whatever is in this terrible world, they have different ethical norms, and in order to compete in this big wild world, we have to adapt to local customs. So, I, I mean, statement that the ethical relativism is that not only because of legal things, also because we don't know any, we, we can't be anymore on the spot. You know, you have international procurement processes. Yeah, everybody works international. You, you, uh, when you know how an Apple is, uh, an iPod is produced, you know, in all parts of the world, this doesn't work anymore. So this ethical relativism is there. The second thing I think what's new is Corruption is not a necessary evil, but it's treated now as a manageable risk, at least in banking. So, of course, you have systems and procedures, but, you know, systems and procedures can be, you can put any systems and procedures on it. The question is, do people read it, do people understand it, do people live by it? I think the first step was that you just uh, cover your back. You know, you, you start all these procedures in case you are sued, you can say, Listen, I have a compliance officer, I have my, my code of ethics, I have it on the website, I, uh, I have uh, everybody sign it each year when his salary is reviewed, we have to sign again the code of ethics, just in case he, he or she forgets it. Um, so you treat it as a, you put in a lot of system, but all with the silent understanding we have to do that stuff in order to uh, be legally okay and not be sued. We don't have to do this stuff in order to make more money. We don't, we don't have to do this stuff because we want to be clean and white. 
but we do it just because it's now a new fad in business and it could be ethical. And you have the ethical investors and we don't want to have any problems at the shareholder meeting. I think this was one step. But, and I still think we are mainly at that level. The next step to come to be really convinced, it starts from above, where people have to be ethical. Not only ethical in business, also ethical in their private life. Especially in Europe, you know, because of the recent discussions, they say as long as he's ethical and clean and everything in his public life, in his company or wherever he works, it's okay. The private life, it's a total different story. At least since uh, the last couple of weeks with the IMF scandals and so on, I think it's important that also the private life is to be okay and ethical, not only the public life. So there is no schizophrenia anymore between, you know, from, from nine to five, I'm okay, and then after five, I'm a private person, I do whatever I want. Okay. Then the next thing is, I think we have to manage that it's not only risk avoidance, which means I don't go to those countries. I know a lot of companies who are not investing in Ukraine or in Kazakhstan, and all this kind of stuff. Well, the risk is too high. You know, if I have one scandal in Russia, you know, my share price goes down three cents, and this is much more than I can ever make the next hundred years in Russia. So instead of managing the risk, they try to avoid the risk. Um, I think uh, the majority of companies say now, if I do it right, I can work in any country in the world. And secondly, uh, I think people realize also that risk is not only in those terrible emerging markets where things are full of pride and so on, and we found out that you have also a considerable amount of bribes in the developed world. In, 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 in the United States, they are just more sophisticated and in different ways. And the main target is to stay out of jail, not to be ethical. As we know from the Goldman Sachs cases, there's a huge difference between to be legally okay and to be ethical. And I think people are now aware of this. So I think these are the main developments which we had. Just go ahead. Okay. Um, I prepared uh, for this audience here. I think <clears throat> the um, history here was already explained. And we have four questions. Which we are, uh, which we're asked in this context, and I won't read them out. Number one: Is it the right thing for Siemens if you are in such a situation? Number two: Is it consistent with core values, or as we write it here, with Siemens core values in mind? So, company and private. Next question: Is it legal? And is it ethical? It was just <coughs> mentioned by you that this can be different. And number four, is it something I'm willing to be held accountable for? And if the answers to all of these questions is it's okay, yes, then one should go ahead. <coughs> I think um, it is something which, uh, and I fully agree also with you that you say that this relativism um, doesn't, certainly no longer applies for Siemens and Siemens employees, um, because this is why we have stated these Siemens core values, um, and they are the same in, in all over the world. So um, exactly this relativism um, has changed, which uh, clearly did exist. Just maybe um, uh, for the avoidance of doubt, but you mentioned that it's okay in Germany, but not, uh, it's okay outside of Germany, but uh, not within Germany. That ended in 1999, yeah? So this is, uh, and by the way, this was the same approach uh, which existed in the United States. 
just in the United States. This ended in 1977. So, uh, I mean, 22 years uh, is, is a big difference. And um, um, you also mentioned that uh, in some companies um, prefer to avoid markets because they're risky. Um, due to our geographical distribution, we don't really avoid markets. And I think there is also something in this that one should engage, yeah? being there. Um, and if we are there with uh, the way we want to be now and the way we, I believe we are now, um, I think this can also help to further the understanding um, to a certain extent. Um, I'm sure, I mean, uh, one cannot uh, uh, eradicate this. I don't think it can be eradicated. But while you can minimize it, and you can show, as I like to say, that in a relative desert, you can have uh, maybe a plant, maybe a bush growing there. And as we all know, if um, you already have a little bit of shade, then this will be a better environment for the next plant to grow. And this is how I think one can further the idea of, I would now just say, ethical business, because I think we should go beyond just the anti-corruption thing, what we were also discussing in the focus group. With this, I just, with these thoughts, I would like to hand over. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter, in keeping in line with what you were talking about, there's a wonderful book. I don't remember the author of the book, but the title is There Is No Such Thing <clears throat> as business, e business Ethics. There are ethics, and there's nothing separate for a private life and nothing separate for a, a, a business life. And we see, for examples in the United States, when we have people who are in positions of power and are not willing to subscribe to the fact that there is one set of ethics, they will go as far as to redefine certain criminal acts or, or misdeeds, if you will, just to justify the position. I'm thinking, for any of you who might not guess, I'm thinking of presidential um, or presidents, past presidents. We built a company here in Hungary where we set an example and we set, we were real upfront. We, about 15 years ago, we got involved in Hungary in the banking sector, which had its similar challenges as banking might have in many other parts of the world. And the CEO for our company was a well-to-do American guy who happened to have a very strong set of ethics. And he made it painfully obvious to everyone we did business with that he already has money. And if the only way to make money in Hungary is to cheat and pay people off, then we're not interested and we'll go do business elsewhere. So I very much agree with Dale. I don't think we should avoid some of these countries just because there's a high risk. But I do believe that we need to know what we stand for before we get into that situation. Uh, because if you try to make the decision not knowing what your stance is regarding that question, and you wait for the circumstances to surface, that will be too late. Uh, one of the best examples, I, I used to live in Dallas, Texas. And I attended, forgive me for, I don't want to offend anybody with this example, but it was a wonderful example coming from a Baptist minister. And he was talking to 3,000 people, and he said, if you wait to decide what happens between the boy and the girl on the back seat of the car in the driving movie, if you wait to make that decision then, it's too late. And I chuckled then and I thought, oh yeah, right. And then as I got older and I went out to the business environment, we saw how people didn't necessarily have a strong backbone and they figured I'm incorruptible. There's no deal you can put in front of me that, I, you know, that will sway me. And you start to see how people begin to rationalize these things. And the same person who in the beginning just cheated a little bit on an expense report and then maybe didn't tell the full truth. And it's a slippery slope and once you allow yourself to get away with that kind of behavior and you forgive yourself and you don't hold yourself accountable, I really believe we're all susceptible to it. And so to me, when it comes to corruption, it's a zero tolerance, much like the alcohol here. It has to be a zero tolerance. And once we try to explain why it might be okay in this case, we started down slow, that we need to turn around and go back right up. Let me open it right up to questions that, that there might be, and, and reflections on, on what it means to do business in these environments, and any, any thoughts that you have, please. Yes? Yeah, sorry. 
I don't know if we need the microphone, otherwise, please speak up. Yeah. I just have a very spontaneous reflection that says, if it's doing business in a good way, as you said, somehow seems the exception. That means the laws are very weak. I mean, if, if you come to Hungary and say, we are doing a good job here, we're not bribing. And that's special. It just shows the framework is inexistent or very weak. And that's just a very, <laughs> that should be the norm. And Obviously, I see the risks and the difficulties, but it well, really shouldn't be such an exception. I agree that we shouldn't get extra credit for not cheating. I, 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 I fully agree with you. But we're starting from different points. And so that level of behavior is not acceptable for me. But for many, many years, that wasn't acceptable level of behavior. Which is shocking. Which is, it is, but I mean, you know, we're, I'm not sure I'm smart enough or strong enough to go back and change the past. But what I can do is, is say it is what it is, and I need to do it from, from this point forward. I fully agree with you. I wish I had a magic wand. Frederick promised he was bringing a magic wand. <laughs> And he'll solve all our corruption problems after this year. Was it was in the past? Next three billion. There was another question. Yeah, my question. Uh, uh, well, it's a question to to him as the initiative. What you uh, are targeting? Is it only for the academics, or it also involves the the lower education, so high schools maybe, or? you know, younger people, because uh, it is connected, the private life, business life, there is no difference in ethics. So uh, this initiative then, is it broader than academics, or, or if it's only academics, why? Well, maybe you can also help on, on this one, <clears throat> because I think you know the program uh, at least as well as I do. Um, the program, if we're talking about this $100 million program, um, was uh, open to uh, these two categories um, and uh, does not really look at uh, teaching uh, younger children how to behave properly and maybe not to throw away things which they shouldn't throw away. Which I mean, you can go really very far. Where does really correctness start? Uh, <clears throat> and I think um, this is a, uh, an interesting idea of yours. Um, I think uh, the fact that we're going to um, a university is already, if you so wish, from the age uh, uh, viewpoint, please don't misunderstand me, but it's one point lower, or even I would turn around positively at an earlier stage. Now, um, whether, and with this program here at CEU and in theory, and there are other programs all over the world. Um, to go one step further and say that we should engage uh, uh, with, I don't know, 14-year-olds or so um, is certainly one which um, is, is new to me. Uh, I wouldn't know how we should address it. Um, I think uh, this age group is one which is, uh, can fully understand the implications and I think it is also the right time to discuss it. Um, to broaden the scope, as I said, it would, it is a new consideration for me. Would you like to add something to this? Uh, maybe I just can add something. I think there's a basic big problem which is still not resolved is um, what is an educational institution supposed to do? Is a university teaching your skill? Or should the university teach, change your personality? And your parents are supposed to have taught you the virtues. No? Or what is a university a brainwashing in here and change it? Then if a university has to change a the personality, they have to be differently organized. And I'm on the board of trustees of a university in Ghana which tries to change the personality and not only teach skills. And so um, uh, I think uh, there was a very famous case in Wharton Business School. There, there was a guy who was convicted because of insider trading. And Wharton uh, did not give him his MBA title, uh, uh, the certificate, despite the fact that he has all fulfilled all credits and so on and so forth, because they said, uh, we don't want to give an MBA of Wharton to a crook. So, and, and this is really, the discussion is not yet finished, for example, 
should should a school only give degrees, not only MBAs, but only degrees, to people who are morally okay? Should school do a moral check? You know, this is a we are still in the beginning of thinking, but you know, there's a very famous case which was widely discussed. discussed. And um, because the question is, whose job is it? When you look at back in the ethics, Aristotle was there, you know, uh, he says you have to be virtuous. Well, where did he get the virtues from? Well, it's, you, you are virtuous from your education, from your family, from, from home. But what happens if you don't have a home? So, so should the people, who, who, is, who is teaching virtues to the people who did not learn it from the parents? <coughs> Our proposition, just to, to respond, is the Siemens Integrity Initiative is not working with that many universities, actually. It's working with the UN Global Compact, which has a, a relationship with a lot of business schools. And so they're disseminating a curriculum through that. And then there is a UN, there's an International Anti-Corruption Academy in Vienna, and, and then this initiative, and a couple of other business schools, one in Egypt, and a couple of other places. So this is the smaller part of, of the Siemens Initiative today. But it's only actually the first five-year element of a 15-year process. So it may well be that if there are good initiatives to do with youth, that they would consider that. If I can just say something on the, you know, the organization I had, Thierry, we work on integrity education in various ways. And, and we think it's an incredibly important part of the equation. One important of many other dimensions. But it's one way of reaching a critical mass of people and instilling insights into ways of building integrity in society. And only through universities is, there, is it actually possible to spend enough time and interaction and to do that at scale. But schooling would be very important as well. There is a group in, in India that we're talking to now who want to do something at large scale. But the one lesson learned from various surveys of efforts in this field is the one thing that definitely doesn't work particularly well is to moralize about the issue and to say that corruption is a bad thing. So what? Right? Yes, we know it's bad. But if you can't tell me how to do something about it, it doesn't help very much. And, and one group that, that we have worked with, for example, in, in Palestine, has done something incredibly innovative. I'll just mention this one example. Is, uh, they're called the Teacher Creativity Center. And they work with teachers who, in turn, work with 13 to 17-year-olds. So very young, some of them. And, and they look at how does integrity affect our society and how does lack of it affect our society. So one group of them went into the biggest hospital in Ramallah and asked the hospital director, could we see the budget please? So he thought this was a nice civics course and he presented the budget to them. And, and they went through the budget and, and there wasn't much that they could interpret, but they could interpret the budget line for cleaning equipment. And, uh, and so they took that item on the budget, divided it by 365 days, and estimated that if all that money were spent on cleaning, the hospital should be spotless. But it wasn't. So they took evidence of how dirty the hospital was in parts. And clearly there was enough here, circumstantially, to show that money had been softened off. So they put together a report, came back with a report to the hospital director, and said, here's what we found. He was livid about it, called the police. The children called their parents first. And, and he lost his job eventually. So this is a form of civics lesson that these children will never forget. Right? It went well beyond saying that corruption is a bad thing. And, and these are the kinds of directions that, that integrity education can go down. Please. Yes, please. In a, in a wildly competitive market, how do you package or sell uh, the profitability in ethical practice? Because um, I don't have a business background, but then I'd imagine that the objective uh, for most people going into business initially is profit making, and then um, essentially um, you find yourself in an environment where uh, you either adapt or die, and adaptation would mean um, kind of bending um, certain rules that people or, or other businesses within the same um, sort of environment are already doing. So how is it that you get to, you know, 
package it. Uh, when you're telling somebody that fledgling entrepreneur or that's just getting into into the business, that wants to do it the right way, but then you know you're in Rome, do as the Romans do. However, what if the Romans are doing it wrong or not doing the right thing? Well, I think it's a very good question. I think you all have to answer it. <laughs> I'd like to believe that there's another option other than you know, you know compete or die and that is compete or kill. So if, if you know what you stand for from a moral and ethics standpoint, then I think you owe it to the business community that you make sure you drive that point home. I don't think any of us, I know in, in my case, we never won all the deals, and there were clearly cases where we lost because somebody else was corrupt or feeding the decision maker under the table. That's part of the game, but that's one of those things that we simply have to accept that will happen. But I do not believe that, actually I believe that most people would rather live an honest and moral life. And what my job is, and our job as either politicians or, or policy makers, we need to make it as easy for people to live honestly as possible. And I, I just know from experience we lose some, but we don't lose them all. I just would like to turn this argument around and say that if you have a company which works on a yeah, ethical basis, I do believe that it is more sustainable. So you just have a trade-off between a short-term gain, if you do this, and the long-term sustainability. Um, two arguments here. With less incentive to compete on the basis of quality and price, product quality suffers. And the other one is, if you have such a um, yeah, shady thing, this leads to, if nothing else, to inaccurate accounting, and that leads to loss of control. Now, a uh, specific situation, uh, and this is also where most of Siemens uh, spent its money on in, these, in this corruption uh, uh, dealings. This was uh, in um, the telecom market. We had a very good product back in the 80s. It was very, very successful. And because it was so successful, we were just feeling great. And you don't have to do anything about it. So we didn't invest into it so much. And then it went on and on and on. What then, of course, many people didn't know is why was it so successful? Because then these short-term gains kicked in. And then suddenly, it just didn't work anymore. We were not competitive technically with our technology anymore. Yeah? And then everyone was surprised. But it was, you know, it worked so well until the day before yesterday. What happened overnight? Yeah? And this is where um, just doing things the right way will avoid such surprises and this kill um, at the end of the day, uh, I mean, not only this, but uh, there were many um, problems or challenges, let's put it that way. And Siemens started in 1847 in telecommunications, and it is no longer any telecommunication operation. Okay? Because it sold it off or mm, went into other joint ventures, because it just didn't, was not able to keep up with the technology because people thought it was a great thing and it was wrong. So, and this, uh, I mean, led to lots of job losses internationally, etc., etc. So, you really have to weigh the short term, the obvious short term gain, to the longer uh, sustainable profitability. Um, we have, a, we had in our bank a loss deal analysis. So when, when there was a deal on the market, in the market, and we lost it, the person who lost it had to say why they lost it. Okay? So everybody was accountable not only for the profit he made, but also for the profit, for the deals he lost. So because you can, you can get from the internet, there are many companies which, send you, which have a database. Here are the deals. And everybody had to justify why we did not do it. So, why, why they lost the deal. 
Sometimes they didn't even know about the thing. So, so they said, we didn't lose it, we didn't even know about it. So he, his bonus was taken away because he didn't even know about it. <laughs> so, but anyway, I found out that many people uh, who lose a deal, lost, always say to their boss, I lost it because the other side bribed. You know, Eric is sort of boring, he's issuing something like this every two months, you know. You know, Airbus is bribing, and we Boeing lose it because we don't bribe, because we Americans are more moral than the <laughs> so, uh, um, I found out that when, if I would be a salesman, and I would be called to my boss while I lost the deal, you know what I would say? I would say, well, probably the other guy is bribed, you know? So we don't really know how much is the case, but it's a big cop-out, a big excuse of salesmen if they were, when they were sleeping, when they didn't understand the needs of the customers, when they had no time to write a decent proposal, if they didn't investigate exactly what the company really wants. So it's very easy to say the other guy's right. Well, shall we take a few questions then together perhaps? And I'm delighted to see so many hands up. In, yeah, okay. There. You had your hand up, Ellen? No? No, actually no. that was my question. That was just All right, that was answered. Okay, so let, let us take then from, from the back. We'll yeah. take three questions together. Yes, you. Okay. My question is, I share your point that ethics and legal is, there should be a distinction between the two. However, in case of legal, it's easy because the law says the rules. But in case of company, how do you define the ethics? Because the company is a set of individuals. And, and uh, it's very easy to say that the GM or the CEO sets the rule, but we know that's not the usual case. i give you an example. Let's imagine a prime minister and the prime minister's wife runs a foundation, you know, giving uh, treatments for cancer uh, in, for small children. You, let's imagine a pharmaceutical company, is thinking about to donate that foundation, a very nice, CSR, donation, whatever. But on the other hand, we, as I work uh, for pharmaceutical company, we have a somehow background intention that that might support the market access of one of our products. Legally, it's correct. From ethical point of view, it's very difficult to decide because for one, it's fine, and for the other, it's not. And then there's a debate. So what's your point on that? Okay, thank you. Yes, please. Yes? Um, I have a question regarding the uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in the United States, as you mentioned it here. Um, what do you think about the facilitation payments, which are actually allowed? So if we really go to this very honest and moral business um, uh, activities, then still we have these greasy payments which are allowed, which still open up the room for the uh, corrupt practices. And the second question, um, if I may, Still concerns the law. I, mean, I think it's an established view uh, that uh, legal, illegal doesn't necessarily mean that it all, okay, corrupt doesn't necessarily mean that it's illegal because it's, corrupt is more than illegal, it's unethical. However, um, when we have cases like Siemens, Enron, Tyco International, it is the natural um, desire of a government to regulate the business to stop the businesses from being so immoral and so unethical. And here we have the other, um, uh, another degree of uh, uh, being, the government being involved too much in the corrupt, uh, in the activities, in the business activities. Therefore, we don't know where to stop. Shall we follow the model of the Germany? Shall we follow the model of the United States of America? Or what shall we do? How not to kill the business at the end of the day and keep it? And can you just define for everyone what facilitation payments are? Because not everyone knows. It's those these small greasy payments you need to, to in order to um, facilitate the process, the certain process and business activities. So if you, for instance, pay at customs services a small amount to customs officers in order to proceed your order faster than it would take otherwise, it is called facilitation payment, and therefore it's not illegal under the uh, U.S. law under the FCPA. Thank you. And yes. Um, to Dale, so, I... Yep. It was actually... But why don't you both... Well, go ahead. You, you first. Uh, I start yes. Off. Thank you. Uh, Manasa, my name is again. Uh, I understand that the essence of an enterprise's existence 
is the product or service it offers. And indeed, undertaking the integrity initiatives is intended to enrich this product or service offer. At the end of the day, probably translating into quality and trust. My question, I would like to learn the experience of the integrity initiative as far as it has affected the cost management of the enterprise. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, it's kind of common today. Like, I really like your four questions. Um, the trouble is there's no easy or, or simple answer to them. Um, and, I, and I guess uh, integrity education is important for business schools that, so that uh, students learn how difficult it is to really make those decisions. It's not, it's not so easy, not only from a moral perspective, but also if you want to take into consideration some stakeholder interests, not only your internal business interest and whether that's ethical or not, but uh, a, a, a comment or a question on that. Do you involve stakeholders in decisions like that? Would you add a few other questions uh, that also relate to stakeholder interest? Or would that, these four questions, satisfy your ethical test when you make a decision? Yeah, perhaps you will start with the two, last two questions. <coughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, I will start, if I may, with the first question. <laughs> with the, because there I have a very a clear answer with this uh, Cancer Foundation. So uh, we do have an international tool um, where if we want to make a kind of a donation, we have to check the background of that uh, entity and we have to check exactly uh, for, 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 for this kind of criteria. And only uh, once that has been cleared, we can do it. Uh, so this is the mechanical answer to uh, how do you instill an ethical culture? Yeah? Uh, one is, of course, that you have signposts which say, blink, 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 watch this. Yeah? And um, in your uh, example, we would not be able to give this donation. Um, or if so, then it would have to, because internally we can always escalate. And I don't know, I'm you know, saying something silly. If, the supervisory board of Siemens worldwide says this is okay, then it would be okay. But it would not be, let's say, my decision here locally, but I, what my predecessor could have done five, six years ago locally, exactly to avoid that. Um, then your question, um, sorry, ladies, uh, first in this case, um, do we involve other stakeholders? No, the, the answer is, is, is no because uh, there is no um, this relativism. Yeah? Because there is one person who makes then at the end of the decision if um, the, um, also all the internal rules are obeyed and we have uh, for donations um, and, and um, CSR activities, we have this one tool called Spodon. Um, and the thing is it says, is it something I am willing to be held accountable for? So, what was new in this case is before it was the organization and you always had uh, several people signing off and it was, well, you had signed off on this and so on. And, and then uh, the you know, responsibility dissipated somewhere and evaporated. And this is what <clears throat> the newer culture is bringing that the guy who signs this is responsible and it might kill him. Or like in the case of Mr. Von Peter, he had to pay 5 million euros out of his own pocket um, uh, to, um, well, pay for the, and this was the case for the negligence um, in, 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 uh, as, as the CEO of the company. Um, so the third uh, question which I would like to answer is cost management. If I understood you correctly, um, how, how did this, um, I mean, there are so many sides to cost manage. Could you repeat your question, uh, just that I can answer it correctly? Yeah, I, I need to gain your experience of the effect of the integrity initiative. 
has had on cost management? On the cost management? Well, um, um, on cost management, I think it had, um, on a, a global scale, it led to reduced costs because uh, people were much less uh, willing to entertain others, yeah, or to be entertained. Um, I was invited by Mr. Galtung on Sunday for breakfast, thank you very much. Um, and what I am doing is I'm writing an acceptance scorecard, or in this case my secretary is writing it and I'm signing it. Yeah? We didn't have that because uh, uh, the, the cost was not that exorbitant, if I may disclose this here. Yeah? Uh, but just for uh, ethical um, um, uh, reasons, yeah, I am disclosing that. Um, and at the same time, uh, we do have, of course, uh, now uh, stricter limits for, for um, approvals. So um, in Hungary, this is uh, 20,000 forints. Yeah? Um, if it goes beyond that, it cannot be approved on a local level anymore. So because of these things, I'm quite sure that we are spending less. Yeah? So that is, is, a, is a good side. Where we are spending a lot more, which might uh, exceed this, is in managing this. Uh, having running a compliance office, 600 people, I think, worldwide, yeah? Um, and those are qualified people. They have partly legal background, and, and others come from sales. So uh, those are not, um, you know, necessarily the youngsters. Now we were just... Uh, we, uh, here in Hungary, ironically, our best export item are compliance officers. One went to Denmark, the other one to Israel, and we have now a lady leaving for Dubai. Yeah? So I had to replenish our uh, compliance officer, and this one gentleman, he has seven years' experience in sales. So, if you take that, if you consider that, that is a massive investment. But, as explained here before, it is, I think, uh, an investment in sustainability. Thanks. Do you want to address the FCPA issue? Uh, about facilitation agreements, yes. Um, corruption comes in all, in many, many forms. So, uh, for example, I think personally that the major transfer of money of, of payments is done through consulting agreements. Not facilitation. For me, therefore, for me, when I look at the consulting, when somebody needs a consulting study, for me in the bank in Russia, any consulting study was first a bribe unless the guy who ordered it could prove to me that it's not a bribe. So I assume that any PowerPoint presentation with four bullet points on 10 to 20 slides is a bribe. <laughs> And by and the way, Siemens stopped all oh, consulting it's a right, because, you know, for a while. Like, like, you know, like <laughs> consulting, <laughs> you know, consulting is, is the funniest thing in the world. Here. First of all, a consultant is only an unemployed executive. <laughs> <laughs> I was once in a reception and the guy said, what are you doing? He said, I'm consulting. As a consultant. And the other guy said, I'm sorry that you lost your job. <laughs> Brussels is the biggest consulting organization. Brussels, uh, I would like to, to commission a PhD thesis about the corruption in Brussels. It's unbelievable because everybody who is retired from the, uh, from the commission, you know, from the commission, from the European uh, um, administration or all these organizations becomes a consultant because he knows exactly who can approve uh, which consulting study. There are 53 consulting studies about the Arab age and nobody has ever been there written off the internet. Uh, so, so I think uh, then then software. For example, I knew that uh, within any companies, the transfer of money is through buying and selling meaningless software. You know, outdated meaningless software because you know KPMG when the auditors come, they don't know how much is, is the software which I buy from another company. Is this worth two dollars fifty or is this worth two hundred fifty thousand dollars? KPMG does not know. They're not getting into the software, okay? So consulting, uh, first of all, corruption is not anymore in cash. Secondly, there are myriads of things, you know, how to take things into a deal, you know, the type of reciprocity. 
I have a deal, I got something, I have a license to drill oil, to build a building, to do something. I take you in and then you take me, okay? To take each other into the deals. This is a form of corruption. So um, I think we have to learn that corruption is fighting back, you know, corruption. In Russia, the guys take bribes, they send their people to a three months executive development program at Harvard. They, they read all the books about, uh, about uh, business ethics, you can even imagine. And they design systems, how to get around it, that it's a corruption, but legally they can't get you. So I think uh, facilitation payment is for me, uh, but sometimes it's a corruption, you have to look at the individual things. But what you said, ethics is nothing to do with the corporation. Ethics Ethics is an individual, a, 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 an individual decision of what is good and what is bad. And the corporations are made up of individuals. A, a company itself is a company. It's not, it's, it's not corrupt because, you know, a company is an abstract thing. Um, so I think you're perfectly right that you cannot say a company is ethical. That's me. You can also only say, that I have a reason to believe that uh, a lot of people in that which are brought by that company are uh, doing the right decisions and not the wrong decisions. Trying to stamp out the corruption is probably a lot like trying to stop the drug traffickers in the United States. I mean, billions and billions have been spent on it. As long as the, the potential gain is as high as it is, to me, corruption is anywhere where I can make extra profit with a smaller investment or less time or less effort. And I think until we start treating those people well, I mean, I see a member of the Hungarian Parliament here, but you have to ask yourself, of all the corruption that's happened in this country, what has ultimately happened with the people who have been caught? And unless you start to raise the, the bar and you start making it feel like there is potentially something where we can't hit back, I'm not sure that you know, it's one thing to have the laws. You asked the court earlier about the questions on the laws. The other thing is to actually make them make a step. Can I have a few more comments and questions from the audience? Yes, please. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, Peter if you could um, share with us some of your experiences that you incurred in Russia. For example, managing a team when you went to Russia first in the 90s. Managing a <coughs> team which is already formed and it is used to corruption practices. So how do you handle those issues? How do you teach them not to be... Thank you. Thank you. No, let me just take a few more. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I would like to know from Stephen see if you can give some more examples of what measures have been introduced. I mean, you have thousands of employees around the world to make sure that they actually comply with, with the high standards. And what happens if if you find out that people actually don't? Thank you. Yes. Behind it. Just behind it. And then you. Yes. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, my question is. Before I tell you uh, this is cause, I read some information on the website of the EU and I read some information that the introduction mentioned raising uh, integrity, raising integrity standard. Yes? And I admit that uh, in doing with some corruptions, uh, raising integrity standard may, may be a good solution. Yeah? But we also know that uh, the factors due to the Corruption includes some other factors such as uh, low costs and legal supervision and uh, rank thinking. And uh, account for these factors, do you think raising integrity standards is also a good way to reduce to reduce the uh, the corruption the, the corruption cases? And how much does it take? And how much does it bring? Yes, this is my question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, please. Uh, just tell me just about business ethics is very essential for the prevention of uh, business corruption. Yeah, of course, I agree with this. Uh, especially, we talked about some big companies such as Zima as the advantage of it. And uh, uh, the big company maybe know what is right and what is wrong. Of course, they will choose to do the right thing. But I'm um, supposing if there is a very small company and uh, mm, uh, it is facing the risk of being bankrupt, meanwhile, there is a very good deal uh, in the market for the company. It's very suitable for, for it. If the company bribe 
maybe he, uh, the company can get the deal and uh, uh, get over the difficulties. Uh, if uh, the company doesn't run, of course, uh, there is no possibilities to get in the deal. So my question is, uh, is it rational for the company to drive to get the deal for the purpose of surviving the risk of being bankruptcy? If you run the company, will you do this? Will you bribe? Will you try to bribe? Okay, thank you very much. One last point there, please. Yes. Um, I would be interesting, interested in hearing from the panelists um, what kind of incentives for companies or what kind of punishments uh, you need for corrupt companies in order to really fight corruption effectively. If you just have the threat of imposing a, a fine, you can, my assumption is, you can include that in your cost structure. You can say, okay, the risk of getting caught is 5%, so the fine will be that. I can include that. Is the only way to threaten with a backlisting from public procurement, uh, delisting from stock markets, which is, I think, one thing that really was a big threat for Siemens or Daimler or others, that they would become delisted from the New York Stock Exchange. And what kind of measurements or what kind of steps does a government have to take in order to effectively fight uh, such headaches? Thank you for that. You understand? I start off. Let me start off with your question. Sorry. It's... <coughs> let me start off with uh, with your question. I really believe that the most effective method is to make sure that there are other things beyond a fine. Because I agree. I mean, most people will think that it's just the cost of doing business. People do that on real estate deals. They say, I violate this. It'll cost me this much money. I just put it in, raise the prices, and it's done. So I think you have to threaten, and then you actually have to follow through. You know, I raise, I have three kids, and I know if I tell them that I want something done and there's no consequence, then the first thing they do is they test me, and the second time they don't even look at me, and they go ahead and do it. And I think that's what happens is we try to solve too many problems at the same time. We say we're going after corruption. That sounds wonderful, but what does that mean? One of the things we did in our company is that we defined as specifically as possible, not all, because we didn't know what all of them would be, but the most likely forms of corruption that we would find our employees or our frontline employees entangled in. And then we told them specifically what the consequences of that behavior would be. We didn't violate anybody's, you know, we didn't accuse anybody of being corrupt. We just wanted to make sure they understood that if these lines were overstepped, they would pay a consequence. So we told them what the consequence would be. And as a re every response to that, all of our employees, when we were building this uh, ATM company, we had 26 different nationalities in it. at one given moment in the company here in the Budapest, Budapest office. We never, ever have to reprimand anybody for violating an ethical uh, transgression. So I really believe, tell them what it is and make sure it hurts. Um, maybe uh, responding to your very specific question. Um, similar as you really uh, mentioned, um, Siemens on a worldwide basis, uh, look what are the most uh, probable um, traps you can fall into. So I already mentioned entertainment, where we have this kind of approval, where we even uh, also disclose uh, when we have been invited, and we also have to disclose the approximate value, etc. That is, uh, and also the frequency, uh, whether this was uh, at which level, um, whether uh, his wife was there or, or, or more my wife was there, that it <coughs> increases the points, goes beyond 23 points, it needs the approval of the compliance officer, it goes beyond that, a certain thing is to go to the cluster, etc. So that's one mechanism. Similar, what I already mentioned before, also to your question, donations and sponsoring, background check. Another one, um, <clears throat> um, business uh, partners. Yeah? Um, again, a known procedure uh, to check those because uh, what kind of a business partner is this? because we claim that we want to go one step beyond not our only our immediate partner, but also the one who is actually in contact with the customer. Because that would be very easy that we say, okay, we have here an intermediate and we sell them X, X, Y, Z, and the rest is none of our business. That is legally correct, but uh, Siemens really tries to go one step beyond that. 
Uh, one other thing, consultancy agreements, which were, were you mentioned, uh, this was also the form how money was taken out of the company and rechanneled um, in, in the Siemens case. So what happened is that Siemens just stopped all uh, consultancy agreements and uh, allowed uh, itself to be sued because they said, okay, a little bit like, not, not a little bit exactly like you said, okay, so prove to me that this, that this is a valid thing and not a phony one. And that where there were valid things, then Siemens lost and said, okay, fine, you proved your point and now we pay. Basically, it turned the whole thing around and said, boom, we just stopped it. Yeah? Um, so, um, maybe just one, one, one other measure um, uh, that, of course, no cash uh, that was taken out of the system already before that. Um, but, uh, you know, you can either do something 99% or 100%. And my uh, example is always a balloon. I say, you know, what does a balloon look like, which is 99% tight, you know? <laughs> Zero. It's not a balloon. Yeah? So, um, so cash was taken out, very uh, strict control over amount of um, accounts which a company has. And um, also all payments now, although we are in just about 190 countries and territories, all of these payments go through one central system, FinNavigate, and all these payments are at the end cleared by this uh, central server. So if somebody wants to say, whoops, we won't pay to this one or that one, be this for terrorist or whatever other reasons, yeah, this can be blocked now centrally. Before, it was not possible because every country paid on its own um, just, and there was no central control. Of course, what we are doing now wouldn't have been possible 20 years ago because with IT, these things are possible today. Second part of your question is what happens to people um, who, where you have violations? Uh, in our quarterly report, uh, worldwide report, there is also a section which says how many people uh, were um, basically fired and, and which kind of proceedings we have. But I can tell you this was a different uh, reason. But if I have a boss who is a boss of Siemens Europe, and this guy is physically sitting in jail, it makes an impression on you. Uh, it leaves an impression on you. You have a Europe meeting at the time in Paris, because we always went to a different country, and the boss was not there. He was in jail. Yeah? Um, and so what happens is people are taken to court, people are fined, people lose their jobs. That's not so much fun. Yeah, I wouldn't want to lose my job. Uh, not that it's so great, it is great, but I'm 54 years old and finding another job, having been kicked out of Siemens for compliance reasons, is not really the good thing, which will make me very attractive on uh, the market. Um, and yet here the question was a little bit, you know, what, how, how big a threat do you have? Um, I think it was mentioned here, or no, I'm sorry, you mentioned it, um, that there was a point when the Siemens situation was so much in flux because of these delistings and, and things that there was the idea that uh, maybe some hedge fund at the time, we we're talking now 2006, when they were still very powerful, would maybe uh, buy Siemens. At the time, our share price was, uh, well, in its third, 30 euros or about. In 30s, the lowest one was 33 point something, <clears throat> um, and the whole company would be split up and, and then sold off. So um, what I'm just saying is that the threat can go much, much further than just saying the, the three cents um, off the share price. It can go really to the very core. Uh, to answer your question, you're not starting from scratch. You're, 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 you have a given environment in the organization. And this was especially difficult in, in, in 
Russia uh, because you see many people in not only in Russia and in, in, uh, actually not not even in Eastern Europe but everywhere. You see, when a when a company when somebody was unethical and then changed his mind, what do you believe him? And I have big big fights. For example, in 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 our bank, I'm. I'm influenced by the Bible. I have to forgive not seven times, but seven times, 70 times, okay? So I thought if somebody, a customer, an employee, um, a supplier is black and is doing unethical things and he makes a decision uh, to become ethical. Like many companies in, in Russia, you know, 10% com- uh, are clean and 10% are criminal, but 90, 80% have, you know, 62 types of gray, you know, a gray, <laughs> like a coffee machine. So the question is, if somebody decides to become ethical for whatever reason, not even for business reason, but just simply cannot live anymore with that pressure, what do you do? You know? So you say, well, we did all these bad things. So the Russians, my, the board members actually, whom I had to supervise and whom I had to give a bonus, they had the opinion, they said to me, Peter, don't come with this thing, you know, to forgive. And if somebody decides and interview him, if somebody will become white, okay? If somebody cheated on his wife Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, you tell me that he doesn't cheat on his wife on Friday, okay? So we had big discussions about that. And, um, I think when you come into an organization which is not okay, first you have to start with yourself. You cannot act around, tell everybody to be ethical, you know, and then do crappy things yourself. Even in the slightest thing, you know, you 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 are the role model. You know, you you are not. You cannot go out. You cannot out. The most convenient thing to get around a decision, which is very very common, is just to just to outsource the decision, you know, to Commissioner McKinsey study that that's okay, to get a legal opinion. If I need a special legal opinion and I go to law offices who want to become accepted as a lawyer, believe me, I get the legal opinion which I like. I don't go tricky shopping, I go opinion shopping among lawyers. Okay? So I think first you have to start yourself. If, if People start to believe that you are ethical and not only people who believe that you are smart enough to play ethical, okay? There's a big difference to play ethical or to be ethical. To play ethical is to make a corporate decision uh, that you are ethical, okay? You put everything on the website. This doesn't mean anything. It's like when a bank decides from tomorrow on, we made here by the decision that we don't give any more bad loans. A nice decision, you know. The problem is, you know, how do you implement it, you know? So you can make decisions whatever you look. You make decisions to look good when they are printed in the newspaper the next day. So you have to start with yourself. The second thing is you have to show consequences and not just consequences of a big figure. Don't don't do this anymore, you know. Or, or do it better that we don't see it or things like that. No, you have to regret. For example, I said if you withhold information, sensitive information, from the board, if I find out that you hide information from the board, you are not only fired, you also lose your pension. Okay? And the second thing is, and we also report you to the police, I think the thing is, people accept a penalty because they hope they can pay it with a bonus, you know, later on with the company. Or the company pays it. Or your dear no insurance. You know, we all have a dear no insurance. You know, and uh, uh, because you pay, the company pays a huge sum uh, for fraud or for when, when a director is is sued. So I think the the real good thing is what you said. The only thing which is effective is not to get anybody away with a with money with a penalty. The only thing to go to jail. That's a, that. This is. Where, where it talks. To go to jail is something totally different than to pay $2 million. Okay? Totally different because it exposes you everywhere. To pay $2 million and the company likes you, you get this a bonus. 
pay too many dollars, you the insurance pays it or whatever. But to sit in jail, okay, away from your family and visible for everybody, this is the hard thing. So I think we should we should move to putting more people into jail and less financial fund. <laughs> <laughs> On that merry note, thank you for your candor and thank you for your excellent questions and have a good evening. Thank you very much.